searching days and days for valuable targets. They're not wasting shells on like three or five guys, what the Russians are do doing. We saw that multiple missions. Because we are clever enough, now the jets are coming. We are... Uh, no! no! No, that was... That was uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. This is just the real answer. I don't know. And this is like something of... Um, uh, wait, first your question. So, the artillery system was the advantage from the Russians. Still, the Russians have a lot of jets, still advantage, but they doesn't can use the jets because they doesn't want to sacrifice. Everything is possible in the military. It's just a question how many jets they want to sacrifice. We s so this is like the amount of gear, jets, tanks. This is the big advantage that Russia have, and of of course the human material. So, in what kind is Russia very bad? is still the tactics on the field. We're not talking about big movements behind the lines. We're talking about how to use your troops, your infantry, your uh, mechanized infantry, your tanks, all your weapon system combined together at the same time. And we see that, that Russia is not good in that. Instead of making a good plan, there's even younger officers, there should be younger officers already, like in this war, because in this war are uh, fighting mobilized soldiers from both sides against each other, be honest. Um, most professional soldiers are even dead, injured, or in just particular units. So what we can say and see is they're really, without any mercy, ready to sacrificing their own people. On a, even me as a soldier, I was more than once, I captured myself. I was, some Russians showed up, walking by, no cover, no formation, like in a huge blob, and we just like, okay, we inform the commander, he sees on the drone, just wait until they come close enough. We shoot them, done. And then after the mission, after one day you question yourself, so why they're doing this? Why they're sending untrained, unexperienced, even, like when someone is walking in a blob formation so close to the zero line, it is an unprofessional behavior, like an untrained soldier. The question is like, how, do they, how the commanders can live with that to sacrifice? So that's what I'm personally questioning me. Live with that to sending young, because you go there also to loot the AKs, trophies, some patches, and you see the faces. You see it's a human being, a man even without beard, like boy, 18 years, it's sad, but from my perspective, like how the commanders can do that, that's a really big thing. And yeah, also the Russians are not really good in combining all the systems what they have together at one point. Just sometimes, I guess this, I guess this is just the reason because they have not enough resources anymore. Because when we see scales, even like reports about Ukrainian war, in the beginning, Ukra uh, Russians was using, doing one day, 60 to 80,000 atri shells, compared to Ukrainian 10 to 15,000. Now it's so much different, it's less artery, less indirect, and this was the big advantage. So they lost, because there's like sending wave after wave, and the whole Rush, the whole Ukrainian, sorry, the whole Ukrainian, um, um, doctrine is about holding the lines, rotating your soldiers, um, kill wave after wave until the enemy is so out of man, have so less artillery. Because for a better understanding, Ukraine will never destroy all artillery systems from Russia. We will never destroy all tanks in, uh, from Russia. But what Ukraine 
already proved against all the professional think tanks, generals, uh, bloggers, they're saying, yeah, Russia have to not enough tanks, enough artillery system, but the people don't understand Ukraine doesn't need to destroy all systems. Ukraine just need to destroy and damage all the system on the front line faster than Russia can bring new to the front line or repair the old ones. And that's actually we're coming to the point of no, this actually is already a point of no return, but we're coming to the point and then the Russian logistic will not breaking, falling apart, but doesn't can bring enough stuff and gear and systems to the front where it's needed um, as the Ukrainian have. And that will be then the, the big thing, the big moment, I guess. What do I feel when I'm in action? I was I was pretty surprised to learn that I don't often get adrenaline rushes, um, which is a good and bad thing. I don't I don't get like when when shit's blowing up or when someone's wounded. Um, maybe that'll hit me later in life. I don't know. Maybe it's like a delayed onset thing that I'll suddenly get crazy PTSD and and be a fucking wreck. But what was surprising to me was that I don't feel much in combat. I'm kind of, I'm pretty focused, which is good. I've had a few instances of like, not panic, but kind of the shiver down your spine. You're like, oh, I don't like these vibes. But yeah, I, I'm surprised to feel that I can, I can. So in combat, I would say, or I personally don't feel scared. It could be because of uh, adrenaline. But I have noticed that uh, you get scared when you are back from the mission, when you are getting uh, to your sleeping bag and starting your night's sleep. That is the moment when you get scared as your stress level comes down. It's very, very hard to describe the feeling when you are in battle. It is, there's no other feeling, but uh, you don't feel scared. That's, that's what I can say. You, you feel very focused. If you, are, if you are on the right mindset, you feel focused and only focused to the, your mission. I would say that changes over the course of a mission. So, for, and I, I, I guess it's different for everybody, but for me personally, it's always you, you get in the BTR on the way to the battlefield, and and you're you're super hyped up, and like yeah, we're we're going out, we're we're gonna do stuff now, and then you step off, and it's that first artillery shell that brings you back to reality, that immediately lets you know you've got to be careful what you do here because if you make a mistake, you're dead. Or even worse, your buddy is dead. And so for about five to ten minutes after that, that first shell that lands really close, um, there, there is this sense of, of being scared. However, you know that your only way to survive is by keep moving forward. Um, but it settles. You, can, you, you cannot stay this active for, for an entire mission. So after a couple of minutes, maybe an hour, you start relaxing again, you start sitting in your foxhole, you start listening to shells whisper, and you're like, huh? That wasn't close. Oh, that one was close. And you're just sitting there and, and talking, talking shit with your friends, and just waiting, waiting for what's next. And the longer the mission goes on, the less you care about everything that goes on around you. And you just work on, on autopilot. And you don't really think about what's happening that much anymore. I guess the biggest thing that I'm thinking about is what are my guys doing? And like, am I putting them in a situation where I'm going to get someone killed? Um, as long as we stay calm and return fire, then everything is usually okay. Um, it's a lot of 
you're, you're thinking about a million different things at, at a time. You're, you're, con you're walking forward, scanning everything, trying to check where your guys are online, seeing every little position that someone could shoot you from, hoping that the explosions don't hit you because you know, you're walking through a minefield in a forest, bullets are coming at you from this way, artillery is coming this way, AGS is coming from over here. You're just, um, yeah, you just have to focus and fight. So, yeah, but then, I don't know, there's also an element of like, I guess you'd call it a bloodlust, you know, that drive to fight. Um, but then there's also, when we do have a close call, you look over and you see one of your guys fall over and you can't see him, like if he's wounded because of the foliage and the trees. And you're just shit like, I need to go over there and be there for my man. But at the same time, I got to watch my sector and return fire because there's bullets flying everywhere. Um, yeah, that's all right. Just keep calm, return fire, watch your sectors. Yeah, you just have to remind yourself of, the, of your job. You need, to un you need to remind yourself you're part of a bigger picture. You're not an individual soldier. You're like a hive mind of a unit who's working as a group mentality. Um, and everybody does their little part to try and complete the objective together. Yeah, so you just have to keep reminding yourself of that, you know, just I'm part of a team. Uh, I'll watch their back, they watch mine. I'd risk my life for them, they'd risk their lives for me, stuff like that. Stress, excitement. Um, it's kind of hard to think about it like on the moment. So like if I walked to those trees right now and it was dark and I thought there might be Russians that are gonna shoot me any second, it's uh it's very stressful especially when you're the one assaulting so you're out of cover the people you're assaulting are probably in cover they only have to like listen to where you're at and start shooting and you can so you're you're a lot more vulnerable than they are um so it's it's stressful but it's um and it's again it's um it's it's the unknown in front of you you don't know where they're at and you know which isn't nice but it's also like it's very exciting and um you know it's it's shitty but it's nice and um like that's what we all came here to do so it's nice to be doing it even though it's a little bit dangerous the first two to three hours it's just a snake eating my stomach after that when you are most likely under um most likely are com more confident after the first two, three hours. So, okay, good. You have an air for the indirect fire. Is it close? Is it far? And then you feel some kind of better. Still, like, um, you try to communicate as much as possible. Maybe you get a salt or something. Yeah. And over this, it's like a very huge stress situation. And most likely, it's like on the position, it's a threshold stress level less because most likely the Ukrainian doctrine or the Ukrainian idea is to let the enemy bleed out so let's send them just the troops and the vehicles and they will lost them and it's actually work it works in Ukraine because of the Russian doesn't have a tactical answer on that so on the position I feel pretty safe actually they walk in they walk out this is the dang very dangerous part it's the very dangerous part and yeah when artillery murders and helicopters when this hits you close yeah then actually you how to say there's a switch just like survival mode move on go done that's it and when i remember on one mission everybody was uh, after it was a huge mission everybody's face was black from shooting from the mud and blah 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 you were sitting in the btr um, the BTR starts driving and after like one, one kilometer, everybody was just silent. And after one kilometer, everybody like starts smoking, talking, la uh, laughing. So, oh, we make it. Yeah, yeah. And then like all the emotions like, uh, like drops at once. So that's it. So sadly, I must say that it's, it's, it's like the most addictive drug that is existing on this planet. 
it's uh, it is sad because it's not something that you want to do or something that we should be doing but it's hard to describe but uh, feeling of survival like surviving when you shouldn't survive is 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 I guess what all the chemical drugs and everything has been trying to copy since their existence and and nothing can come close to it like the feeling of of not dying but yeah it's it's sad but I guess it's evolution for us to to enjoy it Um, jet bombers are uncomfortable. Uh, on one of our missions, uh, we were digging in and we had some friendlies north of us that kept getting bombed by, by aircraft. And afterwards, one of the aircraft came back and I, I just remembered thinking, please not me, please not me, please not me. It wasn't me. He dropped his cluster bombs on, on the friendlies and as bad as it sounds, but in that moment you're just thinking, thank God it hit them and not me. Um, tanks. Tanks are annoying because you don't hear them shoot before they, uh, before they impact. If they shoot at you, you just hear the explosion. Um, but to be honest, I think the scariest thing is being in a place where you do not have any concealment above you where you know the drones can see you and where, where you know they can direct the artillery precisely on you. Um, I think that is uh, the scary part. Oh, and open fields because of the landmines. There's a lot of scary stuff here. How quickly... How quickly you kind of... Not become complacent, but you become used to just getting blown up. Like, within my first seven day rotation um, back in March. I can't even tell you how many times I got blown up. I got, at I got attacked by basically everything other than a jet and a knife. Like machine guns, rifles, drone dropped grenades, AGS, mortars, artillery. A friend of mine got a, a, a TBI, a brain injury because his uh, foxhole nearly got flattened by a tank. And Obviously, it's not for everyone. Like, not everyone is going to react that way, but I, I very, very quickly, you learn what is shooting at you, what it sounds like, how, how much danger you're actually in when you're six feet below the earth. Not dead, obviously, but when you're, you know, in a, in a foxhole or whatever. Unless something lands on top of you, a lot of the time you're pretty safe. And you very quickly just kind of, like I've, I've been sitting there just eating a ration while Russians like 800 meters away are boom, 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 with an AGS, just dum, 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 all over us. And I'm just not a care in the world. Because if it happens, it happens, right? But it's, it's, just, it's weird how quickly you kind of just, eh. Honestly, like you would think being shot at would be the scariest part, but it's sitting in the trenches because when you're sitting in a trench, like you've completed the assault and you rotate out, you move back further so that you get to rest a little bit, you would think it would be safer, but in reality, you just have to sit there and you hear, oh, where'd it go? And you just hear, kaboom, kaboom. Sometimes it's close, sometimes it's far. You yell out to your guy, you're all good, mate. Yep, I'm good. It's like, you can't do anything about it. You just have to sit there and wait. Um, when people are shooting at me, I can shoot back and stop the, you know, you can take care of the threat. But when you're just sitting there listening to artillery, it's scary and you have to tell yourself like, well, there's nothing I can do about it, so I'm just going to sleep. Or I'm just, you know, you sit there listening to it, you try and distract yourself by, I hear the, I hear the, uh, the explosion of them firing it. You listen for how long it travels through the air until you hear the impact. Um, and then you can kind of start to zero in where they are. So the more they shoot, the more information we get. So you just have to, it's scary. That's the scariest part. 
because you can't do anything about it, but you find ways to distract yourself and to gather information from it. Um, yeah, so probably probably the artillery, or uh, I don't know. Sometimes when they when they are close to you and they're fully automatic, because you can see the face through the scope. Just <laughs> when they walk up and they the surprise on their face of oh. There's people here, and then they try and get their gun up, and you're just shooting at each other. That can be pretty scary too, but I think the artillery is the scarier part because you can't do anything about it. You just have to do what you can. Yeah, mostly sleep. <laughs> Honestly, you know, uh, I guess artillery, you know, gets everybody. You know, if anyone says you know they're not afraid of close artillery, you know, they're probably lying. But uh, it's it's, it's artillery is not so bad, you know. I, I feel that if hmm, and the only thing I really fear is letting the people, the men that I work with, down. Um, I know going out on missions, you want to make sure that you get all of your guys back. Um, I've been fortunate. I, I went on a, a lot of missions, and and all the missions I went on here, I've only had one injury, and that one injury was me. So um, on that mission, there, were, there was five people. I was the only one that got injured and we were able to complete the mission and get out. Um, had to put, uh, use a, a, a lamp frontel or a headlamp in English. And I had to put it over my face to cover uh, a wound. Um, but if I ever lead guys out on a mission, whether it's eight guys, nine guys, you know, whatever, if one buddy gets, if someone person gets injured or one person dies, I would prefer it to be me rather than anybody I'm responsible for. I believe that is the hallmark of true leadership. I wouldn't want to let anybody down who is underneath me in my little wing. And I definitely don't want to let Major Kenobi down. I don't want to let anybody in Ukraine down. And we just want to be really effective against the enemy, for sure. I was just interviewed by Deo Cevelle because I was ordered to do it. But uh, the leftist media left all the good parts out, by the way. <laughs> I think it was too based for them, but uh, to them I told it's Yavariv, but then I went to bed in the evening and I was kind of thinking about it and I realized it's, it's, it has to be the waking up in, in the military hospital after getting wounded. Uh, the, like feeling you cannot move, you cannot breathe. You don't know what's going on, and uh, yeah, just not being able to breathe. Like it's not because of wound, but like your head. It's you are so anxious, so scared that you can't breathe, and you. It's yeah. <laughs> The beginning, I think, uh, before the war, I'd say most people would only know about our past uh, little indifference, like uh, Ratentia, where uh, where we kind of repelled you, <laughs> uh, Ukrainians, uh, regiments under uh, Soviet army. But to me, like, after being in Ukraine, I would believe it's because uh, Soviets uh, made Ukraine to fight the war, fight. But then again, it doesn't really matter to look in the past like that. What happened, happened, and nowadays I'm sure everyone will just think of Ukrainian Cossacks and uh, the sort of spirit. We, we call it in Finland the spirit of winter war when like a nation comes together despite all differences and just has the one goal of surviving. And I think Ukraine has sort of rekindled that in, in our eyes. And it, it will, be. It's, it's wrong to say it's winter war spirit. It's, it's the spirit of Ukrainians and, and us Finns together. So nowadays, I would say it's sort of brotherhood nation.
I believe in most people in Finland who I know. They, they see Ukrainians and Ukrainians as, as our kin and having the same spirit. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, it was a big part of the decision to come to Ukraine as it's like um, we, we got volunteers, people came to help even if their governments didn't do so much. So collectively I think we kind of owe not to Ukraine but, but to, to the world, like to something, you know, uh, to give back the aid that we got. And yeah, it's, it's, it's been like rekindled interest on, on the volunteers of Finland also. And yeah, it's kind of sad they don't think about it too much, but I'm uh, also glad that Ukraine has given us more opportunities than Finland did to the, our volunteers to actually join the fight and do the part on the front. So, yes, there is some same similar uh, future, fiat, fiat futures as we had in our winter war. We were the smaller one and the Ro and Soviet Union was the aggressor. Now Ukraine is the smaller one and Russia is the aggressor. Uh, Ukraine didn't have immediately the web. It continues to arrive. And we had, had uh, fought volunteers fight for our country, Estonians, Swedish, and now Ukraine has volunteers from all around the world to fight for freedom. It's some kind of um, uh, startup preacher, Easter startup preacher. So it's some kind of the same old story, evil versus good, invader versus defender, uh, people who doesn't want to accept the liberty, democracy and culture from the neighbors and they find way to insulting them and to attack them. Uh, for example, before the war, actually the invasion of uh, Serbs started in Croatia, uh, um, Serbia support uh, Serbs in Croatia and yes, there started some kind of revolution and there was a lot of propaganda, but that was before my time. That's, just can tell what uh, is written in the history books. Um, but I have to say like the big difference between these two wars is the time, the technology and the amount of the number of both countries who are here fighting. Because that these two Balkan states, Serbia and Croatia, now they are in peace after all and I hope it will stay like this, because this war was really terrible. Um, but in the fact that Russia have so much citizen, and it's a so huge country, uh, I'm very afraid this war can be really long and cost a lot of people, um, because the numbers are just bigger, and also the technology, I mean, the Serbian Croatian war was in the 90s, now we have 2023, so that's 30 years of more technology, more shells, more drones, satellites, etc. etc. So yeah, it's really a different kind kind of thing. But what I can say and tell that the fighting spirit and the morale from the Ukrainians are the same like the Croatians that doesn't want to give up. That doesn't want to give up their land, their nationality, their culture, their land. And that's the same like here. Uh, yes, my great grandfather fought in the Winter War, in the Continuation War and in the Lapland's War against the Germans in 1944. And he also was, uh, he, he fought in, in Karjala, he fought in Salla and he was an infantryman just like me. And uh, he was also wounded around the same area as I was wounded. So that's some kind of family tradition, the wound in the buttocks. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my father, my uncle, uh, my grandpa tried uh, to go in the, uh, in, the, in the Croatian army, but they said he's too old. Um, who else? Let's think. Yeah, my uncle, my father, 
So this is so my, my closest relatives. And then I have to say, it's, so in the street where I'm living, so you can really like go by the houses. We can go by the house and can say, this dude was there, this dude was there, this dude was there, this. So a lot of people, a lot of people. So in Croatia I have now, um, I wouldn't say not the best, but there's a Croatian, um, Croatian veteran club. And so yeah, that's celebrating of course the days of victory and other things. So when you go there, you can talk with the people like what was the experience. Also, I talked with them before I was in the war in Ukraine and after because I was like three months in Croatia. And I get released from the hospital after two and a half weeks from Zagreb. So I had to go to physiotherapy. But still, I was able to like also go to the coffee and other, other things, talk with people. And it's really a different, it was a different war. So less indirect fire. Actually, the veterans are very surprised how many indirect fire is happening here. They're not, that doesn't can believe it actually. In a while since, since I read the books, uh, well, since I read the book. Um, however, I have to say, having been here, I understand it's so much more than I did back then. When I first read it, it was just because I was interested in the topic of World War I. But it reads a bit like a story, of course. Um, having been through this, the first thing that I find very surprising, it, it is something I've noticed um, when watching the Peter Jackson's documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old, as well. Um, the mentality that the soldiers had back then is the exact same one that we have today. Um, from the stupid pranks you, you pull with your friends that you just have to try and make sure nobody finds out about because otherwise you're going to be in trouble to sitting in a field watching, watching the aircraft fly by, shooting each other down and not really thinking about, oh, that, that means there's people dying, but just, I wonder who of those is going to win. Well, we do the same thing. We're sitting here, we're listening to the artillery guns, and every now and then we're like, hmm, what kind of gun do you think that was? No, 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 nah, it must have been this one. And it becomes so normal. And like now that you mention it, that one scene in particular comes to mind. Um, in the book, in the scene where one of them dies in the in the field hospital, and even before he's he's dead, one of the other guys asks if he can have his boots after he after he dies. And if you read that as a civilian, it sounds a bit cold. Do you think he was your friend? Why is this what you're thinking about right now? But such is war. People die, and you have to accept that. And sometimes your friends die, and when they die. The only thing you can do is try to make their death save other people's lives. And if that means that you take their equipment, their boots or, or their, their helmets, their magazines, all the fancy stuff they bought for 100,000 Rivna and during the last shopping run, if that helps you and your other guys to survive, take it. Because that guy is dead. He is not coming back. Leaving that stuff for him or putting it in his grave with him will not help anyone. The only way you can make his or give his death more meaning is by using what you can to help the cause. So I, having had those experiences, it's, it's very interesting how I can relate to them. I guess the shooting a drone. The sh uh, uh, some shahid, some they're shooting something, or a depot is blowing, uh, burning, whatever. Okay, um, what? Actually, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. What I can say is that uh, that the Ukrainian people, as some kind of as the same as the Croatian people, and the Croatian people had the war. It was a suffer for all the people there. I know just as a kid how it was to see the parents, my grandpas, how they behave. And it takes time to heal that. And I think, sadly, I think a lot of Croatians, they just, they just want to really deal with it. They're just like, okay, that's in Ukraine, but now we had our war, we don't want any more war. Maybe it's this kind, but I don't can really judge these people. 
um, all the civilians, all the soldiers who went to hell and take this victory, they're just, I guess, one piece. Um, a lot of people in, in Germany, they, they don't really seem to understand the situation here. Uh, they have no concept of, of war outside of history books. So there's the people who think that we're just sitting here doing nothing. Um, there's the people who think that we're constantly sitting between artillery shells and dead bodies and, and uh, ruined houses. And there's also a lot of people who seem to not be caring about it really much anymore. Uh, because they've, they've been seeing the topic of Ukraine in the news for a year now and for them it's just something that happens on TV. It is not something that affects them personally. So for them it's just, come on, same old story, give me something else. Um, which I find rather dangerous, especially because the war is heating up uh, into one of the more active phases since it started. And right now is the time where we could use the most support from outside of Ukraine. I'm not a politician. I, I am a soldier. It is not my job to, to question the, the decisions that the politicians make. Um, I would say, however, that it's, to one degree it's an economical decision. Uh, things like, like gas we got from Russia very cheaply, which allowed us to improve our country for, for a very small financial price. However, it did make us dependent on them for those, for those resources. Um, Aside from that, the fact that East Germany was part of the Soviet sphere of influence um, even after the fall of East Germany and, and the fall of the Soviet Union, the mentality still remains within the people. And people who have been raised with the, uh, with the idea that Russia is their friend, that, that Russia is their big brother who will take care of them, that is an ideology you will not get out of people's heads. So I think that that is one of the reasons why this image of friendship with Russia has evolved over the years which is now definitely at least being put to the test. Yeah, this is a problem because uh, you have more uh, Russian propaganda. C'è molta propaganda russa in Italia. E molte persone, molti italiani eh, ci credono. They believe to what they say, the Russian propaganda. This is a stupid uh, choice. I'm Italian. Sono italiano. Sono qui, sul campo. I'm on the battlefield. I see what happened here. Sto vedendo con i miei occhi cosa sta succedendo qua in Ucraina. E posso dirvi solamente che quello che ascoltate, quello che sentite da, da, dai canali russi o qualcosa di simile, sono tutte stronzate, cazzate. All, all you hear from a, a Telegram channel, Russian, it's a bullshit. It's, it's not the truth. Mostly that it's, it's real, it's, it's happening. A lot of people seem to think that this is like fake or that there's, that we're all paid actors. Um, I had a lot of people try and convince me that this wasn't a real war, that it's all fake, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I'm out there on the front sitting in a hole being shelled and shot at. And then I, you know, I'm like, hey man, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure this is real. Like, I don't know about these Russian actors, but like, he's really good at pretending his limbs aren't attached anymore. Um, it's real, it's happening, it's present, people are dying. Like, you can't just, just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening to somebody else. You know, you can turn your cheek and look the other way, but just because it's not your problem now, it doesn't mean that one day it won't be your problem. Um, yeah, that's kind of going back to what the rest of the world should know about this is just because it's not their problem now doesn't mean it won't be their problem one day because you know we laugh and joke a lot about um especially in britain um we laugh and joke a lot about kind of our old imperial history and our colonial history and you know kind of all these incredibly racist things and oh these people are inferior and oh we'll just go over there and plant a flag and let's take this country da, da, da. that is russia today that that is that is what they are that is what they are doing and is what they've been allowed to do by the west for a long time john mccain um god rest his soul um i mean predicted this to a t a long time ago there are a lot of people in the west that just do not understand russia um <laughs> There's a name for it, and I, I can't... Is it Maskirovka? 
the, the kind of Russian political aspect of saying one thing when you mean something else. You can listen to the Russian UN security, which is its own thing, the, the Russian kind of speeches in the UN and Putin's speeches and what they say and what they mean are not the same thing. And I think a lot of people in the West, too many people in the West, kind of take them at their word when their actions speak louder than words, man. They are in this country to take over this land. Um, they are in this country as they have been in countless conflicts over the past 150 plus years to expand and take territory. And the only reason that more countries join NATO is to avoid being a victim of that expansionism. NATO is not an aggressive alliance. And I think people would do well to listen to Ukraine and listen to Ukrainians, listen to Ukrainian voices. Don't listen to, I think analysts and open source intelligence guys definitely have their place. They do a lot of good work, but I think when it comes down to it, listening to Ukrainian voices and the voices of us that are on the field and the ground uh, should be the bottom line. Like this is the way that it is. Oh, they know, they think I'm crazy. Meine Eltern wissen, dass ich hier bin. Die mögen es nicht. Die glauben, ich bin verrückt. They I think they support Ukraine, but they, they, would, they don't want it to be me who's here. They, they, it's, it's, my, the way my, my mom said it, she, she said, I understand why you're doing this, but why does it have to be you? Why does it have to be my son? And my answer to that was because if, yes, everyone who fights here has a mother and every, every mother of those people who fight here is probably thinking, why does it have to be my son? Why, why can't someone else go? And if, if we apply that, then nobody is coming. So my family, I think they know. Yeah, they know. Uh, but I don't, I'm not sure if it's a positive or a negative thing for them, for me to be here. Uh, but I hope that they respect my decision to be here and uh, I hope they are proud of me. I don't know. I really don't talk to them so much. Uh, but uh, I think they know. On the season even here in Ukraine, my family don't know nothing, man. I call my mom. Mom, I'm in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you talk with your family before to start, you say, where are you going? You're going to a, a war country. It's no good, you know? But uh, is now is my family approved it. Last time I come back in July for two weeks to visit my, my children, my daughter, and my family too. And my mom uh, pick up me with the car and go to the train station, you know? Now it's okay, but he, all the time, uh, it's so a little bit scary because uh, you know here uh, is uh, 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 you have a war inside this country. It's not safe. Maybe you know what happened: the Russian bombing the, the town, civilian people die for nothing. Maybe you you are not in the front line. You are maybe in, in a city for take some some chill, something like this, and they bombing you. You know? Yeah, my family is aware uh, of the work that I'm doing, but they are a bit on the fence about it. Obviously, the, my parents aren't too happy, you know. They're worried about me and stuff like that, but at the same time, they respect my decision. They know what I'm like and what I'm after, so they, I think they understand why I came here. Um, they're sort of trying to help in their own way. My father's trying to reach out to like uh, aid organizations to try and get us better equipment or for example, coming up this winter is going to be pretty rough. So he's trying to get us thermal layers to keep us warm, maybe even some push to talks so we can actually hear people yelling at us on the radio. We, uh, we tend to have a few communication issues on the radio, so being able to hear it in your ears during a firefight would be really good. After I get injured, he, he nodded, yes. The first time when I came here, um, I get injured in a battle in Ternova. 
Um, then I get told I need the operation and that the Ukrainian health system doesn't can provide this operation. So I get transferred from the Ukrainian government, actually, thank you, Ukraine, um, with um, ambulance from Kharkiv to the border from Ukraine, get picked up there from the Croatian side and they drive me over Hungary to Croatia. And in Croatia, in the capital city of Zagreb, I get my surgery and after three months, I was able to move my fingers and my right hand again because I get a shrapnel right here, destroyed uh, one nerve and like literally after the shrapnel went in, I was not anymore able to use the, the hand and the arm, like just fall down like that. When she saw, uh, she, she came, after I arrived in the hospital, I informed her, uh, she came, so my family, I had, doesn't had a chance to inform my family I'm Ukraine because I lost in this battle my phone, sadly. I almost, but it's okay, I almost died, so fine. I'm happy to be alive, but... Um, so the Croatian new, new space was full of a Croatian uh, who fights in Ukraine, so the, she get called, it's me, and blah, blah, blah. So um, when I met her, when she met me, she came to the hospital after my surgery, and she was just asking, uh, you will go back? So that was the first question from her. Yeah. So basically, I think there's a there's an emotional answer to that question, and there's a there's an economical answer to that question. They don't they don't exclude each other, um, but they can be they they can be seen separate. I think on the emotional side, this is a war for a country's right for self governance and independence and for its own freedom, and this is a fight to show that. No country, even if it's a nuclear power, can just say, oh, I will take this because I want it, or because I feel like it, and, and because this is mine, or because I, there, there were so many reasons given by Putin for why he started this war, uh, from denazifying Ukraine, to liberating Luhansk and, and Donetsk People's Republic, to restoring the Soviet sphere, uh, sphere of influence which would contain so much more than just Ukraine. And allowing Putin to just go ahead with that would allow many more nations to fall, fall away from democracy, fall away from freedom. And I think especially a country like Ukraine that is so economically important for Europe and the rest of the world, especially with its grain production, um, it would be a disastrous sign if we would just give up something this economically valuable to the West and to, the, uh, to democracy, to someone who this drastically opposes all of our values. Um, and even if Russia would at the moment not be able to take on P uh, Poland and thus NATO, this brings me to the, to the economic answer to the question. The amount of resources, money and equipment that the Western powers have sent into Ukraine so far will only be able to be useful to them or to be paid back or, or sent back if Ukraine wins this war. Even leaving the emotional si uh, factor aside, if Russia wins this war, all of this equipment will fall into Russian hands. All of those funds will fall into Russian hands. And all of this will strengthen Putin's army. All of that technology will fall into their hands and can be reverse engineered. And at that point, maybe not immediately, but a couple of years down the road, a conflict between Russia and NATO might not be as one-sided as it would be right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know about uh, this, uh, you have a city in Ukraine, it's the center of Europe, yeah? I don't remember the name. You know, uh, Ukraine is Europe. This is the answer, man. This is the answer. This is a, a Europe war in the center of Europe. And, uh, you know, we fighting now for don't fighting tomorrow. If we, if, uh, we win this war, um, the next year, we have a normal life. Ukraine have a normal life. Europe have a normal life, you know. But we have to win. 
because if Ukraine don't win the war, the next year, the next uh, maybe 10 years later, what, what if the next country, you know? We have to destroy Russia. This is the only solution. Uh, firstly, it's just right. <laughs> if you think otherwise, like, uh, just go... Uh, it's a Finnish proverb, I don't know. If you think otherwise, you should just go into yourself and think, why the fuck do you think so? What the fuck is wrong with you? But if, if that's not enough, then uh, it's also like, if you live in Europe, it's, it's your only choice also. Like, if Russia don't stop in Ukraine, uh, good luck eating, uh, it, drinking uh, beers and dipas freely in Germany and Spain or whatever in Europe. You either stop it or eventually it will come to your home. Quite simple. For the nature of good versus evil, for all the democratic, capitalistic values that we hold dearly in the West. The main pitching point is, oh, da, 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 if Ukraine falls, the Baltic states may be next, Moldova may be next. I mean, that may be true, but the main thing is, you know, good versus evil, you know, to, to help, to help. It, it, is, it is the thing to do. And most importantly, not just help enough to prevent Ukraine from losing any more territory or, but to really give everything we need to completely push every Russian Federation soldier off Ukrainian soil or bury them beneath the soil. That's, that, that's no more trickling in funds and weapons. Give everything we possibly need to win this fight unequivocally, unconditionally, unconditional surrender. This is, this is a high intensity war. This is, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, these were low intensity conflicts. And now, we're, we're passing intermediate intensity. This is on a level of, of a world war, especially the other day with Ukrainian special, uh, I'm not saying anything, with, with the Wagnerites getting killed in Africa. Now we have maybe allegedly Ukrainian forces uh, killing Russian forces in countries all over. Ukraine, Russia, you know, maybe here, maybe there. Just, just give us everything we need to win this war unconditionally and to get every square kilometer of Ukrainian soil back in Ukrainian hands. Uh, good, I, uh, good. So the simple answer is because of the geostrategically um, nightmare what will happen when Russia takes over Ukraine for NATO and the Western world. Um, the other thing is from, let's say, a moralic perspective, but I will not even say a moralic, just a principle. How you can say in the, any Western world, we have justice, we have freedom, we have peace, we have free economy, free votes. You have that all and your neighbor, what is not even like, be honest, with a jet, you are from, in one hour, you are in Paris from Ukraine, with a jet from Kiev to, or maybe more, one and two, let's say like that. So how you can produce all those things and don't support freedom, free market, um, democracy, justice, even in front of your own home door. It's something about people lost trust in their own governments when things like that going so worse very close. Because when Russia wins this war, that will be an example for every dictatorship, for every people who wants uh, an authoritarian system established in this country, that is possible and the Western world is weak. So some, sometimes you need to show strength to protect your freedom. And sometimes you have even, like the Ukrainians now, you have to fight for your freedom. The price is horrible and it's a huge nightmare for the whole nation because I was also in Ukrainian hospitals. Ukraine already sacrificed uh, a whole generation, I would say. But I'm pretty sure that after the victory, even your children's and your children's children's, will, there will be 
at least one or two or three days in a year where everybody will remember their freedom and what this cost. Because when you want to understand Ukrainian war, you have to go to a gra graveyard. Честно, воно для мене завжди проходить дуже тяжко. Всі випадки, що в мене були, що в мене були втрати в підрозділі, іменно безповоротні, то для мене це проходило дуже тяжко. Але, допустимо, якщо воно, не дай Боже, ставалося в процесі виконання завдання, я спочатку завершував завдання, і після того, вже от коли вже голова відходить від питань бойових, і від те, що сталося, для мене ну, просто середне розривало. В майбутньому завжди починаю думати, типу, а що я міг зробити краще, чому це сталося, як я міг його врятувати, як я міг зробити так, щоб він вижив. І там починаю все в голові провертати всі можливі етапи, моменти, типу, де я зробив помилку. Ну, я деколи навіть себе роблю в тому всьому країні. For me, I've really never thought about the question before. <laughs> but for me, it means that being a legionnaire means that I'm here to help the people of Ukraine, doing good for this nation. And I'm proud of it, and it means it's an honor for me to be a legionnaire. And once a legionnaire is always a legionnaire. For me personally, it's... I joined because I want to be a soldier. After the Brotherhood in Arms, after all the things what happens, after the sketch you, it's for me just like an honor to still be here. An honor to be a part of history and even my words, my name will never go in the history books. Maybe the Legion will be honored to be in the, some kind of Ukrainian history books, some, not in everyone in the school, but for some professors. And then we can say, yes, we helped uh, Ukraine, people around the world help Ukraine, not even with just giving their stuff, with really like physically help and yeah, Mixed emotions there. It's, um, I guess, brotherhood, stuff like that. It's, um, a lot of the times, it reminds me of just, it's like living in a big flat with, like, all your mates and things like that. It's, um, yeah. Sometimes it's a big happy family. Sometimes it's purely drama, as with any unit. But, you know. I think I've, uh, like, I would risk my life for any of them. Even, like, we don't all get along, but we're all adult enough to realize that we need each other. Everybody's here to do their part, and I can respect them for that. Like, if you stay and you fight, I'll respect that. If you choose to leave, you know, that's your choice, it's your life. Um, if you don't want to die, then they have the freedom to choose and they knew what they were signing up for, so if one of us does pass away, it hurts a lot, but you kind of have to keep moving forward. Um, yeah, we're in a very fortunate position compared to a lot of the Ukrainians where we actually have the choice to leave. Everybody else um, is kind of forced to stay, but it's made me very grateful for a lot of things. It's a real eye-opener to like, Something as simple as like running water has yeah has become what do you like a commodity? Not a commodity. I'm grateful for the little things. But being in the Legion is Yeah. I'm not sure. I guess a brotherhood, yeah. It's hard to describe. I've never really thought about it. Um Yeah. Brotherhood. Brothers in arms. Same with all of the Ukrainians as well. We'll, uh, if we see each other around that we recognize, we'll, you know, shake each other's hands, wish each other good luck, even though there's the language barrier. We don't speak Ukrainian, or we can't really, 
and they don't speak English, but it's, it's like a connection that you make because we're all fighting the same war. We're all going through the same stuff. It's, um, yeah, it's been good. The, the whole brotherhood aspect of this whole thing. Yeah, for me to be a legionnaire is defend Ukraine, man. Yeah, I, I like it too because I like it because uh, um, legionnaire is a people from another country fighting for Ukraine. Here, I from Italy. You have, but you have people from every country in the world, and I like this because because. Uh, Every people have a story in the, in the past, you know, and uh, here we are, we are here all for help Ukraine. This is the legion for me. This is uh, to be a legion. I'm happy that I'm not sitting at home doing nothing. And I'm happy that at least for the time being, it feels like I can cope with it and be effective and do my job. And I'm happy to know that I have participated in the saving of Ukrainian lives and I have participated in the taking of Russian lives. I'm not happy um, in the abstract to have participated in taking lives, but as far as I see it, this is the most morally kind of black and white, this may be a controversial opinion, this is the most morally black and white conflict for a long time. There is a clear aggressor. There is a clear invader. There is a clear defender. There is a clear people that do not want this war. And there is a clear people who talk about genocide every day on their propaganda, ten pro propaganda channels on TV, right? Like you have Sovolev and whoever else sitting in that gaudy nightclub fucking, you know, we will nuke everyone and we're going to invade Finland and we have to kill all these Ukrainian dogs and saying all this stuff. And then they mobilize guys or they have contracted guys and those guys make a choice to come to this country. And as soon as they cross that border, whether it's from Kerch into Donetsk, into Luhansk, and the guys who came, you know, Sumy and Chernihiv and Kiev and dug trenches in the red forest and got radiation sickness. Really good idea. They made a conscious decision to not object. The Russian people that participate in this war have made a conscious decision to participate in attempting to eliminate Ukraine and Ukrainian people. I feel zero guilt, zero sympathy, zero compassion for any Russian that dies. Because anyone, any Russian soldier that is on this land has made a choice to come here and has made a choice to participate in what is effectively a genocide. So fuck them. Our Ukraine will win. Because author authoritarian states like Russia, they never succeed. They might succeed temporarily in, in, in a smaller scale, but they always fall apart. Whereas Ukraine is a country that exists because it is supposed to exist. It is not governed by someone who is trying to force the country to exist even though it wants to break apart. It is its own country. The people in this country see themselves as Ukrainian. They want to be part of Ukraine. And just for that spirit alone, I, d I think the spirit of Ukraine will never die. I think even if Russia were to manage to occupy all of Ukraine right this moment, I don't think Ukraine would actually go under. I think Ukraine would then still survive the fall of Russia and it would re-emerge in all of its glory. Because Ukraine is freedom and Ukraine is liberty and you you can try to oppress freedom but freedom will always find a way to overcome oppression it has the world support and 
I don't know, I know the guys I fight with are going to stay here until it does. So, it has to. Because uh, we're fighting on the right side of history. Like, objectively speaking, we are the good guys. Like, we did nothing to provoke any of this, but Russia still thought that they could bully their way into... I, I don't even know what the objective is for them, but... You know, we're the good guys. It's, we've got the support, we've got the backing, we've got the mentality to fight. We have high morale for the most part. It's the, the Russians, they're just really not, their hearts aren't in this fight. They're only here because whoever's above the, the people on the ground has a, has a gun to the back of their head. Um, if the Russians weren't threatened with death, they wouldn't be here. We've seen drone footage of Russian officers shooting his men because he wasn't willing to, they weren't willing to fight or they got wounded and he wasn't willing to evac them or medevac them, so he just put a bullet in their heads. The, um, the Ukrainian people, they are defending their home, you know. It's a different type of mentality. Uh, the Russians are just, they're being abducted from their homes and forced to fight in a foreign land that they know nothing about. They were surprised that we have footpaths here and roads and all these first world things that they've just never experienced before. Um, that they're just not they're just not willing to fight. They'll run when they can. They know they're gonna get executed or sent to a gulag, but they don't want to die. So the Ukrainians will stay and fight as long as it takes. Um, yeah, it's all about mentality and perspective, you know. So I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to win this war. It's a very, like, it's almost guaranteed at this point. Um, either, yeah, this is probably the end of Russia. If they hadn't have done this, nobody would know what Ukraine is or was. But because Russia decided to throw a temper tantrum, now Ukraine is a, is on the map. It's it's known. You know, it's getting the support. It's popular. Like, this is this is the testing ground for the West. You know, we this is where they finally all of their technology that they've been developing to fight uh, Russia and China and stuff. This is the testing ground to see if it works. So, you know, until the unlimited money runs out of NATO or America or whatever. Um, there's almost no way we're going to lose this, so, you know. Plus, as like more foreigners show up every day, more and more. The more people that die, the more of us that show up. Um, our numbers just keep being replenished over and over. You kill one of us, ten more show up. So, I don't know. It's just we've got the numbers, the equipment, sort of, um, the mentality, the will to fight, and I think that's the big thing. Is just we're willing to do the job. The Russians aren't. <laughs> they they really don't want to be here. Um, despite what all the, the Russian propaganda says, the people who are actually on the ground, they really don't want to be here. The when we take them prisoner, they get treated better than their own people treat them. It's better to be a Ukrainian prisoner of war than it is to be a Russian soldier. So. I don't know. We give them the chance to surrender, but if they fight back, well, you know, we have to do the job. So it is what it is. But yeah, I don't know if that's the best description, but off the top of my head, yeah. The answer by the books is because of the geo strategy of the United States of America, produced by Zbrevnik Brzezinski. Zbrevnik Brzezinski, sorry, uh, in his book um, America, the Grand Chess Report, where it's known that the strategy for America is to actually um, making Russia weaker and not any anymore after uh, the Soviet Union fall apart, not anymore making to a uh, world power. So this is the answer by the books. The other answer is like, what is um, what's really what I believe is the people have the right morale. The people are ready to fight. That's it. The people are ready to fight. 
they get the support and some or another way Ukrainian will win because Russia doesn't can produce this um, war so long and so long time with this kind of old systems. So still everything is possible. Technically and theoretically Russia can win this war. But I don't believe it because some other nation, what is what I doesn't need uh, to say, maybe in the East, can help them out with modern systems and other things and they can win. That's possible, yes. They have the men, they can get the equipment, they can win, yes. But the other thing is, the soldiers are not motivated and when we capture them and ask them why you're here, they're like, from I get, I get captured by my own, they sent me to the front to, I doesn't even know I'm Ukraine, like, don't know, like the people, it's, it's reasonable that the people who have actually a reason, a goal to win, that they win. Instead of people who, hmm, why I'm here actually. Why will Ukraine win? Eventually, at some point, hopefully, enough Russians will wake up to the situation, join the Free Russia Legion, and get rid of the mafia that they've got going on in their government over there. Eventually, Russia will bleed the red and the blue off of its flag in Ukraine. It'll bleed itself white. Because what's going to happen, right? Let, let's say in some hypothetical situation, Russia broke Ukrainian lines all across the front and swept across the entire country, which they were incapable of doing when they did it by surprise in February. So they're definitely not going to do it now. Let's say, for example, that happened. Um, do they think that they would just have no resistance? They would have the absolute biggest guerrilla war ever on their hands because Ukrainian people just will not give up. Ukrainian people do not want to be Russian. Ukraine made a decision in the 90s that they did not want to be Russian. Sure, there are people that speak Russian. The history of the Ukrainian language and the Russian language and the Soviet Union and the influences on languages and schools and so on and so forth is its entirely own discussion. <clears throat> Aside from the language that people speak, Ukrainians are Ukrainian and Russians are Russian. No amount of bombs, shells, tanks, terror bombing or anything else is going to change that. And as we saw from the Blitz in the 1940s and every terror, every terror bombing campaign ever, the, the Thunder runs, not thunder runs, the rolling thunder in, in Vietnam, it just strengthens the populace. Everyone just says, like, you get bombed and it's just, I don't care, man, fuck you. Even if somebody was somewhat sympathetic before, the first time you get hit, you know, first time your time gets hit by a kinjal, you don't want to be Russian anymore. And I think we now have an entire generation of Ukrainians my age or younger, uh, obviously a decent number have died, but there is an entire generation of Ukrainians that grew up in Ukraine, not the Ukrainian SSR. So there's a, there is an entire generation in their thirties of Ukrainians that are purely Ukrainian. I think your, your youth, your, your younger generation, as time goes on, not that I want this war to last a long time, but if it did, there's just going to be more Ukrainians that are Ukrainian and will remain Ukrainian. There is no way for Russia to win. It's just a matter of how many bodies and how many bullets and how many children with ruined lives and how many hands and legs and feet and wives and husbands have to die before Russia just leaves. The sooner the better but I know that you guys aren't going to stop fighting. Because we won to win. Huh? Because we won. Because we won to win. Ну, по-перше, ми відстоюємо тут свою землю. У нас більше в тому всьому мотивація. Тобто це для нас не є, що у нас просто який та дядька зверху старих маразматик відправ сказав: "Іди там, воюй, спасай русський мир, блядь". Ну, 
Ми відстоюємо свою землю, ми відстоюємо свої традиції, ми відстоюємо свою культуру. Це якщо брати так от з Жаполівським фактором, якщо брати вже з тактичної точки зору, що ми, що противник, несемо втрати в живій силі, ми несемо втрати в техніці. В живій силі, на превеликий жаль, вони в нас є втрати, але в значно меншій кількості, ніж у противника. В реально значно меншій кількості. Якщо брати по питанню техніці, ми техніку також, на жаль, втрачаємо, але, слава Богу, нам допомагають закордонні партнери, які нам постачають техніку натівських зразків, і в основному це є більш сучасна техніка, ніж те, що в нас було. Тобто ми отримаємо нову бронетехніку, нові машини, нові танки, нові БТР, нові БМП. У нас поповнення йде за рахунок того, так? Противник несе втрати також. Але єдине, що він отримує взамін на фронт, це те, що вони розконсервують. У нас в'їбали Т-64, приїхав Абрамс. У них в'їбали Т-90, припиздував Т-54. Нові слава Україні!